yeah, my talk in the next 15, 20 minutes. Actually, it's a, it's a sort of, a, of an introductory talk um, uh, to the lecture, uh, to the session. It's, um, it's a bit of a broad, uh, broad uh, introduction to electromyography, to high density uh, EMG and to use of EMG for um, unrevealing uh, uh, neural control uh, uh, strategies. So as uh, we all know, electromyography has been used uh, for uh, almost two centuries uh, in a variety of uh, applications. And here you can see some of the classic uses of EMG uh, to estimate muscle force is one of the classic uses to study coordination of locomotion, uh, to look at connectivity among uh, different parts of the neuromuscular system and to study among uh, many other applications. So in some of these uses, uh, you will uh, realize that the information extracted from EMG is not only related to the electrophysiology of the femoral membrane, but also related to neural structures. And uh, the reason is that uh, the generation of EMG is uh, determined by the activity of uh, neural cells in the spinal cord, which are the lower motor neurons. So actually the components of EMG are also the smallest functional units in movement, uh, and these are the motor units. Motor units as the combination of a motor neuron and uh, the innervated muscle fiber. So the EMG is generated by the neural activity of motor neurons that uh, determine uh, electrical activity in the muscle fibers. And the EMG embed in itself the neural drive to the muscle, so the spiking activity of uh, uh, the motor neurons in the spinal cord. So despite being uh, a peripheral measure from muscle fibers uh, that are non-neural cells, it contains information about the neural structure and specifically about uh, the output layer of the spinal cord. So the use of EMG for uh, extracting information on motor neurons has been um, uh, established since long time. The concentric needle uh, uh, introduced by Adrian and Bronk in 29 uh, has been the beginning uh, of the study of uh, motor units and motor neurons in humans in vivo by very selective recording of muscle fibers and as a consequence of the innervating motor neurons. And the number of invasive techniques has been proposed uh, um, following uh, uh, the concentric needle technology. There have also been developments in non-invasive EMG. This, uh, special se this session is on uh, high density EMG that uh, from the other point of view was pioneered uh, by the group of this Stegeman more than 25 years ago in, um, in the Netherlands and uh, earlier in uh, uh, unidimensional system by the groups of Masuda in Japan and later on by uh, Gunther Rao, Roberto Merletti and others. So with this, uh, excuse me, Dario, if I can yeah. suggest, because there, there are some um, connection problem, maybe mm -hmm. if you switch off uh, your camera during the presentation, yeah. maybe it could help. Yeah, yeah maybe let's try. Thanks. All right. Yeah, I will try. Yeah. Um, so the use of these um, EMG techniques for um, studying uh, uh, motor neurons that uh, date back to a long time, as I said, uh, to Adrian and Bronk, basically. And, uh, and this is one of the classic studies uh, showing um, how uh, EMG could uh, reveal uh, um, uh, strategies of uh, neural control of movement. This is uh, a study from Basmejan in Science uh, almost 60 years ago, where uh, for the first time it was proven that uh, humans can voluntarily control uh, motor neurons or motor units uh, when provided uh, with a feedback on their activity. So actually uh, the, the fact that humans can control uh, individual neural cells with biofeedback was proven for uh, lower motor neurons before and then later for uh, cortical neurons uh, uh, by the work of uh, Eberhard Fetz and others. But Basmejan was the first to show this uh, in uh, in humans for um, uh, spinal motor neurons. And here you can see the action potential of single motor neurons that uh, uh, repeat over time and the uh, frequency uh, of discharge of this uh, action potential could be controlled voluntarily uh, by humans. And you can see the 
the setup is uh, a, a wire electrode in um, uh, the ductor polishes brevis, uh, which is one of the end muscles. So uh, nowadays, uh, we have um, expanded this uh, approach by trying to expand the number of neural cells that we can uh, decode from EMG. And the current trends, uh, uh, which is the topic of this session, is uh, to record um, high density EMG, meaning EMG uh, recorded from uh, uh, several tens or even hundreds of thousands of electrodes uh, over, uh, over a mass. And in this case, uh, we get mistures, so we get uh, electrical activity that comes from uh, a number of uh, neurons in the spinal cord. And uh, we look for the sources that are the discharge times of the motor neurons. And so the idea is to invert this process and go from the multi-channel ENG directly uh, to the sources in a similar way as you have seen for the study by, by Masmejan, but uh, increasing the number of neurons that we can uh, interface. So this is possible. It is possible to do mathematically. Basically, mathematically, it is possible to write down the relation between the EMG signal, which are the observations at this level, and the spike in activity of motor neurons at this level. And what relates the EMG signal to the spike in activity of motor neurons is just a matrix, a very large matrix. This matrix is interesting because it's a matrix that allows us to mathematically go from muscle recordings to neural recordings and vice versa. So if we can estimate this matrix, we can apply it uh, to EMG. And in this way, we go to motor neuron activity, spiking activity, or vice versa, we can apply the inverse of this matrix to the spiking activity and we go back to the EMG. So this is quite an interesting um, uh, mathematical tool uh, or mathematical approach for which with a single matrix, we go from mass electrophysiology to neural recording. So from spiking activity in the spinal cord to muscles. Alternatively, you can see this as uh, going from the muscle level to the output of the spinal cord mm -hmm. with uh, the identification uh, of, a, of a matrix. So we're not going to details how this is done, but this can be done, and now it can be done in a quite uh, accurate and, um, and, uh, and robust way. And so that means that with respect to the study of Basmejan that you've seen uh, uh, before, now we, can, uh, we have access uh, to uh, motor neurons in the spinal cord in a quite large number uh, during natural movements uh, in, uh, in humans, uh, also in animals, but in particular in humans. And in this case, you can see the decoding of almost 80 motor neurons with, um, uh, with this type of techniques. So how can we use these uh, uh, for? For example, we can study uh, muscle coordination. We can study muscle coordination from the neural structure that determine muscle activity. So this is a study in which, uh, as you can see, this grid of electrodes have been placed uh, in a number of muscles of uh, a number of extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the end uh, during uh, uh, grasping tasks. And the idea was uh, to extract from all these recordings uh, the uh, output of motor neurons that determine a specific task. So the type of information that you get is, uh, uh, is uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this type. So you have uh, for different grasp types, a number of muscles, and for each muscle, you have a number of motor neurons that discharge depending, depending on the task. So now, uh, from the muscle level, uh, you pass to the neural level, and specifically to the uh, lower motor neuron level. And so in our, uh, in our opinion, the, you can abandon the muscle as, uh, as uh, a specific uh, functional unit, uh, uh, but uh, considering that uh, just as an anatomical unit, but then the motor neurons uh, would be what determine, of course, uh, the task, meaning that you may have clusters of motor neurons controlling um, uh, muscles, not necessarily within the anatomical uh, uh, boundaries. So this is just an example of uh, um, studying uh, of uh, neural control of a large number of muscles in complex tasks. I will provide a few other examples because this is a, a broad overview in which I will not go um, in, uh, in detail in, uh, in any of these studies. 
A next example um, is um, a work by Alessandro. I'm sure he will present it during his uh, talk, which is interesting because it shows how this approach can be used uh, um, even in, uh, in condition when normally it would be difficult to assess uh, this neural structure. So these are infants. Um, they're actually uh, a few weeks uh, uh, old, so very young. Uh, and you can see that there is a matrix here um, on their uh, leg uh, covering uh, the tibialis and calf uh, muscles. And uh, with similar techniques, as I have uh, discussed, the EMG activity recorded during this uh, spontaneous kicking uh, of the babies have been then decomposed into uh, activity of motor neurons. And so now what you can uh, obtain is uh, a kinematics of the movement, uh, these uh, lines at the toe position in the, in the three spatial dimensions. And at the same time, uh, you have the decoding of the neural activity Underline, uh, underline this movement. Mm. So in this uh, study, for example, Alessandro looked uh, at uh, the neural determinants of uh, fast kicking uh, in uh, babies. So he was specifically interested in uh, understanding uh, uh, what happens uh, when uh, the baby kicks very fast, such as in this interval, in terms of uh, uh, motor neuron strategies. And in this case, uh, the observation is the synchronization among motor neurons increases uh, in correspondence of the, of the, fast, uh, of the fast movements. Now, the, the interesting uh, aspect, though, when talking about these techniques uh, is that uh, we do not necessarily only have access to the lower motor neuron output. I mean, the, the lower motor neuron, as uh, classically defined by Sherrington, is the final common path of the neuromuscular system. So it receives input from the entire neuromuscular system. That means that the output of motor neurons reflect uh, all the inputs they receive. And in particular, they reflect uh, uh, cortical input, uh, other supraspinal input, and afferent input. So by looking at the output uh, of motor neurons, we can also go up uh, to supraspinal circuits uh, and uh, ask ourselves uh, if we can determine uh, neural strategies uh, from higher centers uh, uh, looking at uh, the behavior of motor neurons. Here's an example of um, uh, one of these approaches. So this is an example of a, a study of movement preparation in which uh, subjects are just preparing for performing a movement. So they perform a constant contraction for a certain interval of time. And then they have a cue to increase force at a certain, at a certain time instant. Now, during movement preparation, we know that cortically uh, we have uh, changes, uh, for example, in the beta rhythm and a classic observation around the, uh, the beta frequencies, so around 20 Hertz, is the synchronization in preparation of movement. Now, 20 Hertz is outside the bandwidth of uh, our uh, neuromuscular system, as you all know, meaning that uh, an oscillation at 20 Hertz will not be transformed into movement because the muscles uh, will uh, cut the frequency down, uh, acting as low-pass filters. However, interestingly, uh, these oscillations go down to the motor neuron level. And if you look at the spectral analysis of the output of motor neurons, uh, you will find out uh, that you have uh, a quite large frequency range, much larger than the musculoskeletal dynamics. That in itself is quite interesting. But in this particular experiment, uh, you will also um, detect the beta desynchronization, so the decrease in beta oscillation uh, during the preparation task. And so now you see that uh, from a very peripheral measurements, now you are trying to go back to uh, central uh, aspects of, uh, of neural control of movement. Uh, this is um, a, um, a, a also a way to study neural connectivity in a, very, in a very precise way. So this is a very recent paper by uh, Aime uh, Ibanez uh, in, um, in my group, uh, looking at uh, the delay in transmission uh, between, uh, again, cortical beta uh, to spinal nerves. And specifically, the aim was to understand which kind uh, of fibers uh, were transmitting beta oscillations uh, along the cortical spinal tract. You can look at that with uh, so-called coherence analysis, which is an analysis that look at the correlation in the frequency domain between cortical activity 
and in this case, motor neuron activity. And in this study, it was found uh, um, in, uh, uh, in, in the subject sample that it is possible to estimate the, the delay in transmission in a very accurate way. So the delay is transmission of beta oscillations uh, with, uh, uh, from uh, the cortical uh, centers to motor neurons uh, below 30 milliseconds, which also corresponds to the uh, time delay of motor evoked potential when you magnetically stimulate the cortex. So indicating that the fastest uh, corticospinal uh, uh, fibers are transmitting uh, those beta oscillations. Now, it's also interesting to discuss on this topic, uh, what will be the, the, the if there is any functional role of this beta oscillation. You remember that I discussed the fact that uh, they are actually outside the musculoskeletal, the musculoskeletal dynamics. Four minutes and with, left. This, and with these techniques uh, of um, high density MG, uh, one can also plan uh, uh, studies addressing uh, the functional role of this uh, of this oscillation. So this is a, an example of these studies. So this is an example of a study in which uh, uh, EMG signals have been recorded from the TBLS anterior, and then they have been online. So in real time, the composing motor neurons uh, spiking activity. And then the motor neuron spiking activity, which is the neural drive to muscle, has been divided into low frequency, which is corresponding to the bandwidth of the musculoskeletal system. So this is what produces force. And high frequencies, which is what does not produce force, is cut uh, by the low pass frequency response of muscles. And in this study, uh, the idea was to provide a biofeedback uh, to, uh, to health individuals trying to control the power in the low and high frequency band concurrently to understand if beta oscillation, cortical beta oscillations could be uh, decorrelated with respect to the uh, frequency, frequencies generating uh, force. Now, the interesting result is that this is possible and uh, uh, subjects indeed manage to hit targets in this two dimensional space, despite the fact that only the low frequency part uh, produces force. Uh, so basically subjects were able to modulate uh, cortical oscillations in an uh, independent way with respect, uh, with respect to force, which is interesting in discussing uh, the role of these oscillations in, uh, uh, in motor control. Moreover, uh, when asking uh, subjects to maintain a force as constant as possible, it was possible for the subject to modulate uh, cortical beta oscillations as decoded from motor neurons in up regulation and down regulation without changing any characteristic of, uh, of force. So with this, I provided you uh, an introduction to these techniques uh, and uh, some examples of studies looking at neural control and movement. And so I will go to the conclusions in order to be within uh, the allocated time. So uh, basically, I have, uh, uh, I have shown you that electromyography provides as access to the uh, output uh, circuits of the spinal cord. And in this way, actually, the spinal motor neurons are currently the only neural cells in humans that we can study in vivo, non-invasively, uh, so without any surgical uh, uh, intervention. So the access to population of motor neurons allow us to look uh, at uh, uh, the strategies for neural control of movement. I provided you some examples in this respect, some examples on synergistic control of muscles and uh, fast uh, contractions in newborns. And then in the last part of the talk, I've also uh, shown you examples of how we can study uh, central strategies, so supraspinal strategies of neural control by looking at motor neurons. Actually, what I uh, often say in this type of meetings is that uh, it's quite amazing that by recording with uh, skin electrodes on muscles, we actually can establish a brain interface. So we can uh, infer uh, cortical activity uh, from this very peripheral and completely non-invasive measure. And so with this, uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed the talk. As I said, it was quite introductory I look forward to the following thoughts that will be more detailed. Giuseppe, back to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dario. It was very 
inspiring and interesting presentation. And uh, um, I'm asking if there are questions for Professor Farina. Um, are you taking questions, Giuseppe? Yes, 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 we're taking questions, sorry. Yeah. I, I understood that it was a question, but uh, Roger, are you ready? Yeah, if I, if I may ask yeah, Dario a question. Um, thanks, Dario. It was uh, great to hear about your most recent work, uh, much of which I didn't know about. But I wasn't quite sure I understood um, your interpretation of the beta oscillations. You were uh, addressing the question of the functional significance, and you showed that you could upregulate and downregulate. But did you come to some conclusion as to why that beta oscillation exists? Yeah. Hi, Roger. It's good to see you uh, first. And uh, thank you for, uh, for attending the talk. And sorry to you and everybody that there were some connection problems. I hope uh, you can hear me uh, properly now. So, well, the, well first, uh, the fact that, um, that uh, you can uh, completely decouple uh, beta oscillations from um, uh, delta frequencies, which are the low frequency responsible for force generation indicates that um, uh, beta doesn't have necessarily a functional role because uh, you can uh, control it. And this is what uh, we have shown uh, independently of force. And you can up and down regulate it uh, as uh, I quickly shown in the last uh, slide. You can uh, up and down regulate it by controlling every possible uh, uh, by mechanical output. So yeah, we have checked the force variability, the level of force. Uh, we have checked even the, the, the amplitude of the surface MG. So you can maintain uh, the same identical output uh, and you, at the same time, you can up and down regulate uh, uh, beta. So we believe that um, it is not necessarily uh, functional for, uh, uh, for movement. Uh, it may come from uh, cognitive processes related to moving preparation, but uh, most likely doesn't intervene in the dark generation of, uh, of movement. We have some other recent data in this direction, but they are a bit preliminary on that. Okay, I have um, just a, a short question, very practical, Dario. Um, do you think now the technique the, can be applied to most muscles or still, uh, no, more suitable for specific muscle like the tibialis anterior or is there, the, there are improvement in the application of the, te of the technique? No, there are, uh, there are always, there are always the need for improvement. So we have, uh, we, we have experienced as many others that uh, there is quite a variability in uh, how reliable is the, uh, the composition approach across muscles, even individuals. Uh, and this depends on a number of, um, of factors, unfortunately, that cannot be controlled. So there is big space for, um, for improvement. Uh, I think uh, now that we have uh, saturated the, the classic um, uh, signal processing approaches on which uh, the current composition techniques are based, which are basically lines of separation, um, I think uh, there is an um, um, interesting uh, possibility in uh, uh, intelligence techniques that may be uh, may provide uh, more uh, robust results in of conditions and uh, we have very interesting uh, research directions in uh, in that and uh, in that uh, in that line so i believe we still have to improve the technique